Tunes users, welcome to the Iconic Instruments SP140 Plate Reverb Plugin tutorial video. We're very excited about the SP140. It's our first plugin effect, and we have many more on the way. Firstly, if you scroll down to the description of this video, you'll see a table of contents with hyperlinked time markers. So if you see a chapter that you want to jump forward to, just click on the hyperlink time marker and it will jump you to that part of the video. We're first going to walk you through the purchase, download, installation, and authorization process. And then we're going to show you the SP140, its features, and show it in use in a session. So let's get started. Okay, so from our website, if you hit the store button or any of the buy buttons from any of the products, it'll take you to our web storefront. From there, you can choose the SP140 and or any of our products. When you're ready to go forward, you just enter your email and then select your payment method. Depending on the payment method, it'll ask you for different information. Once you enter the zip code, it will calculate your local tax and give you the total. And then once you complete the purchase, the completion page should look like this, where you actually have download links directly there with the serial number. So if you're a Mac user, you can download the PKG file, or if you're a Windows user, you can download the executable file, the exe file. And then your serial number is written here in red. You should also receive a welcome email from us that gives you instructions as to how to download and install it. There's a second email that you should receive that comes from Iconic Instruments Checkout. So if you don't see that come directly after your welcome email, just check your spam folder. There's a chance also that it comes from FastSpring. That's our online storefront. So if you don't see it coming from Iconic Instruments Checkout, just keep an eye out for a FastSpring email. Within that email, you will see the same download links and your unique serial number. Okay, so after you've downloaded the file, which should be by default downloaded to your downloads folder, locate the installation file on your computer and double click on it to start the installer app for Mac or the setup wizard for Windows. And we'll walk through the Mac version and then the Windows version as well. So on Mac, just double click on the PKG file, follow the on-screen steps of the installer app. You're gonna be prompted to accept the end user license agreement. If you want, you can hit the lock symbol to see our Apple certificate. Just hit continue and you have to agree to the EULA. Then you can choose whether you want AU, VST, and VST3. I recommend just doing all three. Very soon we're gonna have AAX support for Pro Tools users, so keep an eye out for that. Just hit continue, then hit install. Then you'll be prompted to enter your computer password. And then it writes the files to your hard drive. You may, depending on your operating system, see this message informing you that the installer app would like to modify apps on your Mac. You wanna hit allow. And that completes your installation. And then your final step is authorization. To complete the authorization, you actually have to open up the SP140 within your DAW. So I'm just gonna open up a session in Logic. You can use whatever program you use. Okay, so what you're gonna to wanna to do is put an instance of the SP140 in an audio track or a bus. Now Logic organizes plugins by the manufacturer. Not everyone does that. For example, Reaper or Luna, you can actually search by plugin type. Currently, the SP140 is not categorized as a reverb plugin. So you'll have to look under uncategorized or other or however your DAW organizes plugins. You can also look under the manufacturer, Iconic Instruments, or you can search. For example, in Luna, you can do a search for the plugin name. The categorization is something we are working on right now. So in our next update, we'll be able to make sure it lands in the reverb in your DAW. So if you're watching this and the update has already been put out, this will not be something you'll experience. But for now, you'll find the SP140 under manufacturer or under uncategorized or other in your plugin categories. So the first time you open the SP140, you will see this screen where you're prompted to enter your serial number. Now this is where you enter your serial number that you saw in your purchase completion page or in your email. Once you enter your unique serial number, hit activate, and then you'll see it processing. And after a few seconds, you should see it just unlock. From then on, you won't have to enter a serial or anything like that. The SP140 will just be available in your DAW. 
The purchase and download process is exactly the same on a Windows machine. For installation, you will have downloaded the executable file, Iconic Instruments SP140.exe, to your computer. So first locate the executable file using your Windows Explorer app. By default, it goes to the Downloads folder. Same as a Mac, just double click the executable file and it will start the setup wizard. When you first double click that executable file, the first page that will show up is this page. For some reason, my screen capture software has some kind of a privacy setting where it can't record certain screens. So this is an actual photo of the screen. It's just a simple warning. It says, do you want to allow this app from an unknown publisher to make changes to your device? This is the same thing you see from the Mac side where we actually have the Apple certificate. The reason you see this come up as unknown publisher is because we're currently in the process of going through a certificate authority to get a digital certificate for Windows installations. So you may not encounter this because by the time you're looking at this video, we may have already organized the certificate. So in that case, you'll see that the publisher, it will be listed as Iconic Instruments. But if you see this page, no problem. You obviously downloaded this executable file from us. You could just hit yes here and it will continue with the setup wizard. Next is the end user license agreement, which you'll be prompted to accept the agreement and hit next. Then the setup wizard is gonna ask you where you want to install it. I recommend just going with the default location, which is on your C drive, program files. So just leave the default and hit next. Then it tells you it's ready to install. Just hit the install button and it will write the files to your machine. This can take a few minutes. Then finally, you'll see this dialog box that tells you it's completed. You just hit the finish button and it will exit the setup wizard. The final step is authorization, which is exactly like on a Mac. You have to open your DAW. In this case, I'm using Reaper and then instantiate the SP140 on an audio track by clicking the effects button. So this window prompts you to pick the plugin you want to put on your track. As I mentioned in the Apple installation section, currently the SP140 is not categorized as a reverb. We're working on that for our first update. So you can see here in Reaper that you can look at categories. You can look at reverb. The SP140 does not show up in there. Uh, you can also look under developers where you'll see iconic instruments and that's where you'll find the SP140. And alternatively, you can also just in the filter dialog box type SP140 or Iconic Instruments, and it will filter out and find the SP140 for you. But as I said, after our first update, the SP140 will be categorized as a reverb and should show up in your reverb category. But for now, you can just search for it or look under developers. So select the SP140, and the first time you open the SP140, you will see this dialog box that prompts you to put in your unique serial number. Just enter the serial number that you got in your purchase completion page or from your email and hit the activate button. You'll see it say processing and then very shortly it will unlock the SP140. You only have to enter that serial number the one time and then from then on the SP140 will be authorized on your machine and available to you. So what is a plate reverb you might ask? In 1957 the German company EMT introduced the first artificial reverberation unit. And so what it was, was a giant steel plate, roughly eight feet wide, four to five feet tall, four and a half feet tall, housed in a big wooden box, like particle board box. So the way this used to work in classic studios is that a console, whether you were tracking live or mixing from tape or from a DAW, it would be coming through the console you'd have sends from every channel that would send off to your single plate unit. And that's very much like what we would do if we were having a, a send effect reverb in this session. In a classic studio workflow, that send would have a pre-delay and you'd have a filter section, typically just a low pass and a high pass. If you engage the pre-delay, it gives you a little separation between the dry signal and the reverb. And the filters really shape the color of the reverberation. So that send would be plugged into the input of the plate. The input would be connected to a driver, essentially a small speaker that was attached to the plate itself. So you would play your guitar and it would drive that plate that would continue vibrating and give you this 
sound as ambient sound as if you were in a space. Now there would be the driver that would drive the plate and then off to the side was a pickup, a single pickup. So that was a mono plate that would then go to the output of the plate and go back to your return on your console. Usually a, an empty channel off to the far right. That's your reverb return. So you would hear back at your console the reverberated signal. Then in roughly 1961-62, they introduced the stereo plate. So it was the same setup, one single driver in the middle and two pickups on the outside. So picking up from two different parts of the plate created this two unique sounds that were very similar but gave you width. Now the dampening mechanism for an EMT plate was basically on the other side of that driver and pickup setup was a giant piece of asbestos. Now originally on the top was a wheel a steel wheel that you would turn and it would bring the asbestos closer and closer to the plate. It never touched the plate to dampen it, but the gap between the asbestos and the plate itself was so small that any vibrations would be dampened. The, the vibrations would be absorbed by that asbestos and slow down the reverberation of the plate. So it would essentially make it a shorter uh, ambience. Later that mechanical wheel was replaced with a motor you'll see the sort of cylindrical motor on top and then typically you'd have a plus and minus button in your control room that would mechanically you know bzzz, and it would move the asbestos closer or further away from the from the plate so we've essentially tried to mimic the same form factor in our interface it's a really beautiful sound people loved using them it's a very complex sound but they've been used so much because you can control the tail length it gives you a lot of control. So they were used ubiquitously throughout the 60s, into the 70s. In the 80s is when digital reverb started to become more of a thing. So that kind of took over as more popular. But still people were using them all the way up until now. People still love the sound of a plate. Okay, so here is our sound alike track in Logic. So we can actually go ahead and put the SP140 on any individual track that we want or we can set it up as a send effect so that you can send different amounts from each instrument over to a single instance of the SP140 or two. You can do like a long and a short reverb. A lot of people do that on sessions. But for now, we're just gonna put it on the drums only. I'm gonna solo the drum bus and I'm gonna put on the SP140. You'll find it here under Iconic Instruments, Stereo, there you go. I mentioned previously in the installation section about the categorization of the SP140. In Logic, Plugins are organized by the developer. So you just look for audio units and then look for iconic instruments. Whereas in other programs like Reaper or here in Luna, we've highlighted the main track here, the stereo out. I'm just gonna click on the inserts. So you can see by manufacturer. So there is the SP140. But just like in Reaper, you can also go by category. So if you'll notice here, reverb and room. Okay, so currently, the SP140 does not show up in the reverb category. The first update we're doing here is going to fix that. We're working on it right now. It's possible by the time you're watching this video that we've already fixed that and you will see the SP140 in reverb and room or just reverb in uh, Reaper. But for now, you can just find it under uh, developer by Iconic Instruments or you can just go up here to the search field same as in Reaper, you can do, you can filter it by search. So there you go. If I type in SP140, it pops up and I can highlight it and there it goes. The SP140 has three sections. The very top section contains the plate selection and the preset selection. The top unit is the send unit and the bottom unit is the reverb unit itself. Okay, so the top section here is where you can select which plate you're using. Okay, uh, there are five different plates to choose from. They're modeled from specific famous examples. Uh, here's your preset selector. There's a pull down menu here. And one thing you'll notice is that it's lit up, but then if you make any change, the light goes out. So what that means is anytime you see the light out, it means that you've made a change, okay? If you reload any of these presets, the light will come back on until you make some sort of change and then the light goes out. So that's a way of indicating to you you're in a preset or you're not. 
You can also use the arrow keys to flip through them. Starting with the send unit, first you have your bypass, your power switch to the send unit itself that you can turn on and off. You have your send width, your pre-delay control, and then this whole filter section. Let's start with the send width. I'm gonna use the SP140 as a send effect to demonstrate this. So what does that mean? Just like what we talked about in the history and workflow section previously, like a classic studio setup where you have a single instance of your plate reverb over here on this bus, and then from each individual instrument, you can send whatever you, amount you want right here from the bus sends. So if you'll recall from the history and workflow section, the original plate had a single driver, meaning that it was a mono input. Now in the digital realm, we have the advantage of being able to keep that send as a stereo send. So in other words, I'm gonna exaggerate this for a second. You wanna put headphones on for this. I have the guitar panned off to the left, okay? And I'm gonna pan the drums off to the right. There's no bass being sent over to the SP140. I've got that bus soloed. So we're just gonna hear what's going over to the reverb. So you'll notice when I have the send width at full width, the drum reverb is gonna be off to the right and the guitar reverb is off to the left. Okay, now I can narrow that and make it a mono input just by narrowing the send width. So now you hear how both instruments are just right up the middle. So that's what a classic plate reverb would have had is a mono input. Now a stereo plate would have a stereo output because it has two pickups on that single plate. But putting this as a stereo width actually makes it as if you have a dedicated driver and pickup for the left channel, as well as a dedicated driver and pickup for the right channel. Or if you wanna choose somewhere in between and kind of narrow that width a little bit, you can do that too. It just makes it a little bit more focused. It kind of brings the ambience to the center a little bit more. It's a subtle effect. I mean, you notice it obviously if I do hard panning here and make the width maximum here. Next, let's talk about the pre-delay. So what is a pre-delay? Pre-delay is just a delay added to the send before it hits the reverb unit. So the result is, instead of hearing the reverb just right on top of the instrument, you hear the dry signal come through first and then the reverb hits a little bit later, well, up to 200 milliseconds later. So to demonstrate this, I'm actually gonna turn off the send from the guitar and the solo, which is later in the song. So you're just hearing the drum send going over to the reverb bus. And I have, I've left the mix at 50%. So you're gonna hear dry signal along with the reverb. This is most obvious when it's at shorter tail length. So I'm gonna drop it down to one second. Here it is with no pre-delay. Now let's move that up to 100 milliseconds, which is a pretty long pre-delay. It almost has a slapback quality, but you can hear the dry signal comes out front and then the ambience is kind of recessed to the back without lowering the volume of it. The filter section is one of the most powerful parts of the SP140. It was very typical in a studio situation that you would have a single plate reverb that was sent from different channels on your console and that send would have filtering on it. Typically a high pass and a low pass filter only just to kind of rein it in because an unfiltered plate is actually a really, really full sound. There's tons of low end. It can be very splashy on the, on the high end. So to tame that, they would filter it on the way to the plate. So we have built in both high and low pass filters that range from totally flat all the way up to 6.4 kilohertz on the high pass. The high pass can be set to 12 dB per octave, which is kind of a shallower, smoother slope, or you can switch it to a brick wall. And that's a lot less natural. You can kind of really hear where it cuts off. Everything from that frequency below is just completely scissored off. And of course, here's the on off. You can just toggle it on or off the high pass filter. Low pass filter, same thing. Here's your on off switch. And then you can go from completely unfiltered and then roll it down all the way down to 250 Hertz. And so that means that anything above 
that frequency is filtered out. You have three options in terms of the shape of the filter. You have a brick wall, as I said, just like on the high pass, very unnatural. You have a 12 dB per octave slope, and then you also have a very subtle, shallow six decibels per octave. And then finally, you have a node where you can actually set your frequency and bump it up to create a little bump or scoop it out to you know, create a notch at that frequency. And then the set screw sets the kind of width, how shallow it is, how wide that notch or bump is, or how sharp it is. So between those three things, you can really shape the way the reverb, the character of the reverb and how it sits in your track. So let's just quickly demonstrate how this works. Uh, I'm gonna use the guitar reverb only, so I'm turning off the drum send, turning on the guitar send only. Let's set the mix back to 100%, so we're only hearing reverb. We'll get rid of the pre-delay, and we'll move the send width to the center. So let's only have on the high pass, and then I'll sweep the high pass filter up as we're playing. You can hear the low end come out of it. So let's demonstrate the low pass filter. First we toggle it on and then I'll sweep it down so you can hear the high frequencies come out. So I'll just demonstrate how the node sounds. Turn it on first. We'll just create a bump at first. And then conversely, I'll pull it down, the decibels down, to create a notch. And then of course we can make that super sharp and really exaggerate it. Or make it shallow so it's very subtle. We'll just do plus 10, which is pretty strong. To sum it up, here's a setting that I think works with this guitar. Just a simple rolling up the high pass, rolling down the low pass to keep it in mid-range. The guitar itself is kind of mid-rangey, high mid-rangey, so I ended up scooping out some of that high mid-range so that the guitar and the reverb separate themselves from each other a little bit. So I'm gonna pull down the mix so that you hear dry guitar along with the reverb. So here it is with no filtering. Now I'm gonna turn on all three, the high pass, low pass, and node. So because you're filtering it out, you're actually, it's less full on, but it actually, to me, sits in with the guitar a lot better with the filtering. And these tools let you shape it however you want for your track. The reverb unit contains the density control, the tail length, meter, and buttons, the drive control, the reverb width and pan, and the dry wet mix knob. Okay, so this is brand new. The density feature is unique. It's a five position switch that actually brings down the density of the impulse itself. Now this was designed by Ernest Chalakis of Numerical Sound. He's the person we collaborated with on this. And um, we're gonna do a blog piece with him as well about specifically his innovations on this. So when it's furthest to the right, it's at full density. As the density lessens, it's still very present. It's still a very powerful reverb, but it just, it doesn't sort of take over the way a full density one does. It actually approaches the sound of a spring reverb, but not boingy the way like certain spring reverbs are, more like the way an AKG uh, BX20 is or 22 they have this kind of fullness. Like there's, that's a spring reverb that kind of resembles a plate. This is like a plate that kind of resembles a full spring. So let's have a listen. I'm just gonna show you two sort of extreme examples here, 
only the drum send is active, so we're just gonna be listening to drums. I have the mix at 50%, so you're gonna hear dry drums with the reverb in the back. Now, what I want you to listen to is when I stop the drums, just listen to the smoothness of the tail. And then when I lower the density, it's got a little bit more of a shutter to it. It's slightly more texturized. So each plate has its own characteristics at full density, but at low density, it's even more pronounced. So plate number two, for example, sounds really distinct when it's uh, high density versus low density. Here's high density. And here's the low density, the extreme low density version. Plate two in particular has a, a, the most kind of spring-like quality, but there are all these in-betweens as well. So if we pick the sort of medium density, it gives you some of that texture without being too shuddery. So you'll have five plates to choose from, but within each plate, you'll have five levels of density. So you can really kind of pick out something that works for your track. And like I said, it's the same plate sound but the lower density versions have a kind of lightness and texture to them that the full density ones don't. The full density ones are smoother, I would say, is the way to think of it. And the lower density ones are lighter and have more texture. The tail length is set by this meter that you can drag the needle up and down to set the tail length, okay? And then there's also the plus and minus buttons that allow you to jump by half second intervals up and down. So let's listen to plate number three at maximum. I mean, it's kind of wild. It's, it's like too much. But if you go, you know, somewhere three and a half seconds, that's pretty typical for popular music. Still pretty wet. Uh, but what's cool in a real plate at minimum, you can get down to like below a half a second. But in the digital realm, we can get even shorter than that. And to me, it's very cool. It's actually kind of sounds like a room. Let's have a listen. Let's just turn it off for a second. Here's the dry drums. It actually kind of has almost like a bathroom kind of quality to it. It's very cool. And if you add a little bit of pre-delay, it gets even kind of cooler. It does have a kind of booth or <laughs> bathroom kind of reflective surface quality to it. So again, this is something that is not realistic in terms of plates, but it's kind of a cool feature. So if I move this up to like, you know, about a half a second. This is really what a real plate at minimum would sound like. Something like that. The drive feature. So the drive feature is unique as well. This is basically an emulation of a tube distortion sound. And what's cool here is that, you know, you can obviously toggle it on and off, but there's a pre and post toggle switch. So what that means is when it's set to pre, you're actually overdriving the send before it gets to the reverberation unit. When you set it to post, you're distorting it afterwards. The clear way to say it is this. When you're in pre, you're reverberating a distorted signal. When you're in post, you're distorting a reverberated signal. You'll notice that it's much um, more noticeable in post. So let's hear what the distortion sounds like. I'm gonna make a few changes here. We have the reverb bus soloed, so it's only reverb we're listening to. The drum send is on. I'm gonna turn on the guitar send. Let's increase the send width so we maintain the guitar off to the left and the drums in the middle. I'm gonna switch to plate one real quick because it's a little bit more of a full spectrum plate, a little bit brighter top end. I'm leaving the filters off, but let's just crank up the wet dry mix so it's 100% reverb that we're listening to. I'm gonna leave the drive off at first. I'm gonna pump it up to like 30. So we're gonna start off dry, turn on the drive for pre, and then post and hear the differences.
The other really unique feature about our drive section here is the high and low pass set screws. So what these set screws do is they allow you to apply a filter on the way into the distortion. So in other words, if I roll down the low pass, anything above that cutoff frequency is not going to be distorted. It's not subject to the drive effect at all. And conversely, anything below the cutoff frequency of the high pass filter will also be excluded from the drive effect itself. So you can kind of shape the color of the distortion. We could do this with pre or post. Let's just demonstrate real quick. So you can hear the high frequency gets cleaned up when you roll down the low pass. The high pass is more noticeable when you're in post because that's where you get that kind of almost explosive low end. So I'm gonna set it to post to demonstrate the set screws because that's where the drive is really exaggerated. You'll notice on the snare hits that it's really bright and fizzy. And when you hit the bass drum, that's where you get that sort of explosive low end. So it's really exaggerated. But what I'm gonna do is notice the snare when I pull down the low pass, it sort of excludes the distortion on the high frequency. It's, it cleans it up up top. And then conversely, when I roll up the high pass, you'll notice that bass drum doesn't have that same kind of explosion sound. And now for the low end. Let's take a look at the reverb width and the reverb pan. Whereas the send width controls the stereo image going into the SP140, the reverb width controls the stereo width of the reverb signal coming out of the SP140. However, the impulses are specifically designed to collapse down to mono without any kind of thickening. So typically with a real stereo plate, you're picking up the reverberation from two spots on the same plate. So if you take those two channels and send them right up the middle, you are gonna have coincident frequencies. You're gonna have overlap, which creates a kind of thickening. It's not the same as a real mono plate, a single pickup panned right up the middle. But our impulses are designed to collapse to mono without any thickening. So putting this at center actually gives you the sound of a true mono plate. I would recommend looking at the history and workflow section earlier in this video, but also look at the send with section to fully understand the stereo image throughout the entire signal flow. But for now, let's just take the drums alone. So we're only sending drums to the SP140 right now and the SP140 bus is soloed. So I'm gonna move the mix to about 60%. So you're gonna hear dry drums along with the reverb underneath. Let's go full width. Now let's collapse that to mono. So you can hear when I stop it, the tail is right in the middle. Now you might be thinking, when would I use a mono plate? Well, if you're interested in recreating sort of a, an early Motown sound, not only was early Motown mixed in mono, but the plate was also mono. But interestingly, if you look at like Cream, Sunshine of Your Love, that stereo mix, the instruments are panned left and right. So they're sitting dry in the stereo mix, but they use the mono plate. So you hear the ambience straight up the middle. And it's kind of interesting. So you might find a way to use that. And of course you can use the slider to find somewhere in the middle. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be a narrowed stereo plate. Finally, the reverb pan takes the reverberated signal and sends the entire thing left or right or somewhere in between. But as I said, as you collapse it over to one side or the other, it essentially becomes mono. It will not thicken the way sending the two channels from a real plate one direction or the other would do. So let me just demonstrate how this would sound. And this is kind of useful, especially for guitars. Let me just show you a guitar example. Let's turn on the guitar send. I'm thinking specifically of the early Van Halen albums. Eddie Van Halen used to typically have his guitar panned left 
and the plate reverb panned right to give it some width. So you're using the stereo image to sort of separate the dry and wet signals. But here's an example. And finally, the mix knob, which we've kind of touched on before as we were demonstrating other things. So the mix is basically just, if it's 100% wet, all you're hearing is the reverberated signal. If you pull that back, it's allowing some of the dry signal to come through with it. So let's just demonstrate how that sounds. And then of course we have the mix solo toggle. So right in the middle of that, if you just want to preview the reverb only to help you kind of sculpt it, the, the filters or the distortion or whatever, you just switch it to solo. So of course the mix knob is useful when the SP140 is on a particular track. If you have it set up as a send bus, a send effect, then typically you'd have that at 100% wet. And then the amount of signal from each instrument is being set by your send from each of those tracks. So there you have the SP140 Plate Reverb plugin by Iconic Instruments. If you have any questions or comments, please send us an email at info at iconic.nyc. Thanks for checking out Iconic Instruments. Yeah.